My name is Dr. Jun Huang Bun. I am currently co-founder of Oregon Vietnam Education, Econ, and Cultural uh, Association. Um, I'm also consulting for Ho Phu Huynh, a Vietnamese dual language program who support the student and uh, the one of the first Vietnamese dual language program in the United States. I'm also uh, consulting uh, on human talent development and management um, in um, several companies. Uh, in my past, um, experience has included 40 years in education with Poland Public Schools. But my proudest accomplishment is probably be the mother of four wonderful children and four beautiful grandson. Welcome to The Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all of Thank you so much, Chi Bun. I um, want to start with asking you about current generations of American students. Is America becoming dumber? Is that an experience that you know we hear about, but is that true um, with test scores and the dumbing down of, of American education? Half of us do not believe that test scores are indicators of success or indicators of how smart, intelligent a student is. He or her or they could be intelligent and could be excellent in many ways, and not the way we test them. And on another camp, we also believe that testing is crucial because then we can determine growth. We can determine how successful are we in um, teaching our student and have they learn the key to education and to teaching is not that what we teach, but have our student learn. How do you teach so that the student can understand? And it involves many things like background knowledge, specifically. I'm just going to give an example because we are Vietnamese, uh, we are immigrants, we come from a different background. So therefore, what interests us more will also encourage us to learn more give us more interested stories to learn. And if our students are not connected or buy into what we're teaching them, maybe we're not reaching them. So, so test scores is always has a controversial discussion uh, between educators. At this time, you know, um, I'm, I'm a racial equity leader. Um, I have done this work for many years and that's what my training is about. So many of our um, people of color, our parents do not believe that testing is a good way to identify our kids. And it's actually setting our kids of color to fail because our tests, our curriculum, our textbooks, our teachers are mainly uh, English, white, um, who do not share the same experiences we do, uh, at least in Oregon. But, but can I make the argument that we, as Vietnamese American immigrants, are competing in a white English setting in the future? So our test scores or the standardizations of knowledge and what we learn is based on the society that we live in. So if we deviate from this idea of testing for just our racial equity or racial uh, background, doesn't that set us up for somewhere that we can't really integrate into American, white American English society? Um, you are absolutely correct. And this is one of the conversation that we have had all the time because I just read uh, Viet Thanh Nguyen, uh, A Man of Two Faces book. Yes. And he's amazing in talking about the sense of duality. For our Vietnamese American students, I believe that, you know, especially in our culture, we believe in test score. We believe in, you know, do your best at school, learn the best you can. And so we, if we speak about 
especially Vietnamese American, we already have the culture of education is your number one ladder to get to success. So wherever you are at, you need to also learn and adapt, right? So the for with us, the learning and adapting and um, to this education system is the only way to be successful. So when I speak earlier, I speak about different cultural, different nations, different group of students. I really um, also want to share, talk about how we are as a role model, uh, as Asian, the model minority. Right. Because we follow directions. We, you know, we go to school, we take everything seriously. We are set up to be Asian minority because we don't fight back. We don't talk back. We don't really challenge people or challenge uh, the system. We really focus on to do our best, uh, learning how to to score better because that's the only way we can get into college, to higher education, to best universities. Um, but I think that's with our Vietnamese community. But with the new wave of Vietnamese refugee uh, Americans, I think there's um, a change in that too, because I think with the first and second generations of Vietnamese uh, refugees, immigrants to the United States, I think we are much, we were much more, and we are still much more um, driven to be successful, to lead, to make a change in the world. Uh, but with the new generation that who is coming up right now, I think that's less so, less than so. Now, when you say the new generation, you perhaps are meaning the third generation, or do you mean the new generation of Vietnamese waves that are coming to the U.S. from Vietnam? I think that they are both. I think the third or fourth generation uh, from us also have been say, Americanized, meaning we, I spoil my kids rotten, right? They really didn't have to like go through uh, the challenges that we did or my parents did um, to be successful. So they don't see the challenges or that we have had. Uh, maybe they see it, but they don't understand that they don't have that um, grit because they never have to work so hard to get to where they, they are. I think that's a real thing that the third generation, my kids or the, the parents that are my age, their kids are in high school. The grit is not there. And the they become more Americanized. They become more comfortable. And we come from a refugee background, which we somehow it's ingrained that this opportunity that we had in the land of opportunity was a very unique experience for us. And all of us really did our best to, to do well in school and become the mi model minority. And today, third generations and fourth generations of Vietnamese in the future are not as ge geared up for academic rigor. And that's why when I hear about this sort of like test score standardization in America going down, I really fear for the status of America and the non-rigor that we experience in the education system. And that's why I wanted to ask the steep decline and the challenge to standardized testing, in my opinion, um, is also related to, you know, this degradation of standards and the degradation of, um, of, of, of ambition and it's so confusing to me. And that's why I really want to, to, to start with that question is because there's so many factors at play, whether it's us being refugees and us coming from different backgrounds that we don't test for, how do we make sense of this all? As you've seen in history, things change. And what around us really change um, the education system. If you look around us right now, the society that we live in is not the same society that we came to the United States 40, 40, 50 years ago. I came to the United States in 1975. The social economy is different. 
everybody can have a phone. Uh, all kids can have a phone. Everything has changed tremendously. But our education system hasn't changed to meet the demands of the changes of this country. So we are still teaching the way we teach 50 years ago. So one of the things is how do we, um, in the education uh, system training teachers, how do we make the changes to give the teacher the tool? to be able to manage, not just teach alone, but they have to be everything. They have to be social worker. They have to be counselor. They have to make sure that the kids are not hungry, not falling asleep in class. All of the challenges that the society has brought into the classroom as well. And teaching has become very difficult in public schools. You know, in private school, of course, when parents have money to put their kids in private school, they don't, the teachers don't have to, to really uh, deal with those challenges. Um, so well, why, why does why is there a difference there? I mean, obviously, I have an idea of it, but I would love to hear from your point of view as an educator for the last 40 years. Why is that the parents that send their kids to private school and they have money, why are the students experience different in a private school versus a public school? Uh, many reasons. Um, first of all, in public school, we teach everybody, everybody. We don't, we, our goal is to provide education to all. We don't get to choose who's going to be in the classroom. So we would have students with, uh, with uh, different abilities, we will have students with lower social economy. We have students who have mental health issues. We have students who are behind and don't have parents to support them. Support them. We have students who have medical conditions, and we have to serve all of them. And we also being paid by taxpayer money and so there's limited resources but we also are um, bounded by many law non-funded <laughs> law such as talent and gifted children um, that we have to you know have a special education for them uh, we also have special education which we have to um, support them and teach them in any any way we can. So, for example, as a, a principal of a middle school and high school, I have a class called medical medically fragile students, and we have classes that's called life skills students. We have classes that we call communication behaviors. So, in each of these classroom, like medically fragile students, these students are disabled. I mean, to we have to use Hoyt lift to lift the student onto. A, a, a high chair, a wheelchair, and then we have two or three people working on one student just on feeding protocols and then teach them, right? You know, teach them like even just movement, right? Like a physical, like a rehab center. But we also teach them how to learn, how to speak, and we provide them with all the keyboards. So all of that is funded by um, public um state money and federal money. And also that, you know, we have a student who have behavior issues uh, that they don't sit in class. <laughs> they would run out. They would just, you know, they can't help it, but act out. Um, they can't sit. Um, so we have special classes for them. And, and now we have a lot of students with Asperger and autism. So they are super smart, super intelligent, but just do not have certain skill set as we are. So all of these um, is come from just one fund, one funding. And then we have students in the classroom, 25 to 30 kids at different levels, because some of these kids don't have the ability to learn at home. They're homeless, so they don't have parents. They have um parents who are abusive to them. And this, I, when I was a 
<laughs> principal, I have to do drug hearing tests on middle schoolers and where they get these things on the table. And then we have to file a report for DHS, you know, all those issues. Then we have to provide the students with social emotional learning needs, social workers, and all of that. So therefore, the money is not really there to support all the surrounding social emotional needs that the, the student get. And then, of course, the student at the top 10% or the top tier will, will suffer because we just don't have enough support, right? Where, and there, there are many successful students, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that the, 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 the money and the budget that we have is not sufficient to serve all the kids the way that we should serve them and deserve and that they deserve to have. In private school, you don't you get to choose. And whoever comes to those school are already taking a test to be the best in the school, to, to have the best test school to get in. So all you really have to do is to teach. It makes um, a big difference. Big difference. Huge difference because you're not as a student, you're not distracted. No, you're not distracted as a teacher. You can follow your teacher, you can follow your lesson plan. <laughs> You can assess and you can have clear guidelines of where to teach them and you can just move for fast and forward because the student get it. You know, and we can do they can do many creative projects to work with the students. And if the student act out one or two days, hey, you're out. you're out of here. Yeah. So that puts us at a such a strange place in, in the society, in American society, where <laughs> you know if you have money your life will be infinitely different than if you don't in the education system. There's just no way around this, right? Correct. Um, you know, we have very successful rate of success in public schools as well. But your question to me was, what's it different education in private school and public school? So I'm not saying that we don't, you know, we don't produce excellent students. I'm just saying that you know, we have many more challenges in public school uh, when it comes to educating our kids, all of the kids. What made you want to become an educator? Uh, what it made me wanted to become an educator was actually a long story, a longer story. I came to the United States with my parents. And then, um, of course, at that time, um, I suffer cultural shock like everybody else who came. Um, and I um, worked and I started working in the school district um, as a, a school secretary. Mm -hmm. And then I became, and I'm like, oh, I am, um, because at that time I had two younger brother and sister uh, and my parents. And so um, that's how I started to work in the school district. And then I just realized, um, and I actually work in the ESL program. And so I start seeing our students who are not um, being treated the way they should be or being provided the education that, that they need to have. And so I actually went to school and became a teacher. So you got, when you were working as a secretary, were you, uh, did you have a degree yet at that point? No, no, I was working. You were working a as a secretary, yes. and so you were just working at yes. nights to get to get your degree to become yes. a teacher. Correct. So I took it took me working, and um, uh, to have and have my my uh, child um, children um, seven years to become a teacher. And once you became a teacher, at that point, what? did you think about because it must have been very different for somebody who just came to the United States, got a degree, and now you're teaching in an American school. Culturally, it's very different from how you grew up, I'm sure. Yes. And um, when I was in Vietnam, I um, was lucky to, uh, was born in a, um, a pretty privileged family. Um, I went to a French school, French Catholic school, uh, taught by nun. 
Um, and our family is well to do, was well to do. And then I came to the United States, <laughs> lost everything, went to the camp, um, went through everything um, that most people who have lived in the camp went through. So, so when I was fluent in French, um, because I went to French school, but English was my third language. Um, I went to American school at night, but my English was uh, not at the level where I was uh, at the very beginning. So when I, um, that's when I never thought I would, I could become a teacher yep. because <laughs> a teacher, you have to actually have the fluent in the language to yes. be able to do so. But um, at, during that time, I was actually was um, uh, supported by a um, gentleman who said that, oh, Vaughn, you could become a teacher, and now they really need teachers of color, so they have this program called um, Poland Teacher Program, who actually will pay for teachers of color to get a degree. So I uh, went through that program, and that program really te taught me uh, on how to be a uh, racial equity warrior teacher. So it's not the program is is through a university, um, accredited program, Poland State University, and I got my master through there too. But it focused on equity work, okay. meaning how you're going to go out and teach all kids. Yeah, yeah. Teach let's talk all. about that, and let's talk about what is the focus of equity work in the education system, and why is that important. Well, first of all, you know, um, education is our civil rights, right? That's it. That's the equalizer for any inequity in this country. So for us, for me, as a racial equity leader, is I my, my goal and my purpose is to inspire adults and community and students to find a new way to ensure education experience, you know, that they are just and they are humanizing, meaning, meaning are there different perspectives in the equity in the curriculum? Are there role models to represent who the kids, most of the kids are? We we are a Poland Public School has 40% of kids of color. You know, and 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 pretty high numbers of kids of color, but we have eighty five percent teachers of color, uh, teachers of white teachers, and at elementary level, it's mostly women, white women, right? So for the racial equity, you know, there's several levels. You know, we have to attack, we have to address at several levels. So I like at the financial uh, department reviewing um request that is more equi racially um equitable so we designed it a equity lens uh, and the district went through 15 years to 20 years of racial equity work um under gracious conversation about glass with pacific education group um so so also within that, are we centering the immigrant voices and the refugee voices um, beside the students of color? Uh, who are we as United States? Right? Um, so, so as racial equity leaders, uh, I was taught to always think about how do we balance or at least think about the group of kids that mostly historically underserved always. So it taught me the critical consciousness to be a equity, equity educator. So that's, is that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And I think, it's important to kind of focus on this uh, and and understand that the worst off 
in the society that we live in, the bottom, whether it's money or a lack of resources, the, the bottom of society, if we keep that bottom at the bottom all the time, it drags down the entire society. So it's important that we uplift the bottom of society and raise the bottom of society. And it starts with education. And it starts in the school. Right. Um, also that, you know, what you're saying just remind me that part of us is how do we inter in interrogate the power is about calling out oppression, right? Is about working to push those in power to take notes of the injustice. Why are we still having this same group of historical underserved students? And who are they? And then we, that also means that interrogating myself, you know, because we, can, we it's very easy for us to tell, talk about integrating other people, but what about us? What about ourselves? The one that could make the difference because I can't really control a lot of people, but I can influence people. And before I can influence people, I have to be very educated and to understand and and feel the pain because I do feel the pain because I've been through all of this. Um, and so that, that creates the passion in me to do that. So I... Um, you know, I started to interrogate my own power and privilege and my role in um, perpetuating and what am I going to do to disrupt inequity in this system. So that means that's really when I, um, <laughs> I was a principal, a very successful principals. And then uh, the superintendent asked me, to take over to be director of the ESL program. And I look at him like, superintendent, I work very hard to mainstream, even though I know how to work ESL soon because I was, I'm successful as an ESL teacher and I, and I am a researcher on ESL and dual language. It doesn't mean that I'm gonna be pigeonholed in to be ESL director because that role is very stigmatizing. I mean, the whole ESL is stigmatizing for the kids and for you know teachers and for um, for us. So I um, I also don't did not believe that and still don't believe that ESL uh, pull out ESL program for our kids to sit in one um, period a day is the most effective way to do it, why the rest of the time, six periods, seven periods of the day, they have sit in one corner and the teachers don't even pay attention to them. Or their peers will laugh at them or don't want to team up with them because you're going to drag me down if I work as a team. These are personal experiences as well, right? Even yeah. in colleges. So so, so that's kind of, and I, and I said, give me three days. And I talked to my husband and I said, oh my God, John, what am I, you know, this is like something I'm very passionate about, but I really, you know, don't believe in it. Um, and four directors have been fired and uh, within five years or quit. Because we have like 156 Office of Civil Rights violations wow. at that time. I know. Wow. It's like, why are you asking me? It's like... Do you need an ESL face in this program to <laughs> to like um, make it better, or am I a poster child for this <laughs> program, or what is it? And so um, we had a conversation, and um, I said, you know, I questioned my privilege, and I said, well, you probably can do it, and if you don't do it, then who? So I took the position <clears throat> with several with three conditions one condition is that i get to change the program anyway i see that it's effective for our student refugee and immigrant students because i have experience in it i have degree in it um and that she has to support me in changing the whole district curriculum program not the esl because it's how the teachers teach the students in mainstream classroom that matters. What's the curriculum uh, that we're teaching? 
are they belittling them in the ES in the core curriculum? Or are we supporting them with stories that matters to them that they can participate in the classroom without being uh, cornered by themselves? And and then uh, the third thing is that I I get to sit in your executive uh, team because ESL director don't get to sit in the superintendent executive cabinet. So I said, that's when your decisions are made. That's when important decisions are made. So she gave me all three. Uh, she had no choice because I'm probably the only person that probably can, who you will even consider. And I was crazy at that time, but I did. And I assembled the, my new, um, um, I kept um, some veteran person because they have history. And I also hired new staff members. And within three years, I got PPS to be out of the all, all of the 150 OCR violation. I um, the standards that we use for Portland Public School ESL uh, was adopted statewide. So, so that's kind of where I was with ESL. Director, And then during that time when I was ESL director, I dived into a lot of information um, on data. And so I noticed that, you know, all of our dual language programs, uh, immersion program in Pompeii School, that have started like about 30 years ago to help with enrollment, dwelling enrollment, and then the, the, um, um, parents requested because these are the most influential um, language like Mandarin, Spanish, um, and Japanese. And so when I look into the Vietnamese student data, they struggle. And it it's not, it's come, you know, like we're thinking that Vietnamese students are doing very well. You know, we excel in tests. We do everything. We got into Harvard. We got into Stanford. You know, but that's a very few of us. There are many of our students who are not doing successfully. And a lot of students now also are not going to college, Vietnamese students. That's another conversation to have after this one. But um, <laughs> but um, I, um, you know, so I would say, well, why is it that Vietnamese uh, Vietnamese um, students are not successful and we are the second largest language spoken in Poland public school. And so anyway, so then I started looking through that data and then I was uh, and then I was promoted to be the executive director of teaching and learning because when I was ESL director, I really re revamped the whole a curriculum because to include ESL in it and not a pull out because then be, then during that time ESL teachers became ESL coaches to core teachers instead of pulling them out they will pull out the level one and two which is very beginning but the other programs you know they have to we have to uh, adapt and teach the teachers that was. That, that was, I almost died doing that because the teachers did not like the changes because yeah, it takes it change, takes change of yeah. practice. Anyway, <laughs> you understand this. Um, so, so that's what I did. And then I, I became executive director and because I believe at that time that I, it's the core that will change all uh, achievement gaps. Opportunity gap, not achievement gap, but we call it opportunity gaps because a lot of students don't have those. So I became executive director of teaching and learning. So when an executive director of teaching and learning, I'm in charge of uh, training principals, teacher leaders, uh, choose curriculum, choose core contents, and deciding on uh, which textbook to use. Um, so all of that. Um, then I begin to start, look at all the dual language programs because in ESL, I'm already like, oh, I have some thought in my mind already. And then when I became the ESL uh, uh, executive director, then I was in charge of dual language program as well. 
So I started pushing for the Vietnamese dual language. And uh, because I said, we are not performing well. Our ESL student, Vietnamese students are, are not performing well. We have a opportunity gap. So therefore, um, I work with my dual language peers, allies, to push for a Vietnamese dual language program. That's when it started 10 years ago. Okay, but if you have a Vietnamese dual language program, you're teaching in Vietnamese in the Portland public school system, right? Correct. And why would, is it just for Vietnamese students or is it for anybody who wants to sign up for VDL, Vietnamese dual language? So uh, dual language is um, half of a day the student learn in the target language and half of the day they will learn in English. So for a successful dual language program, you have to have two equal language partners in the classroom, meaning half of the class should be, let's use Spanish speaker first because they are the, the largest program in, in public public school. So half the researchers in dual language have many models, but the models in the um, Portland Public School is 90-10 models and then 50-50 models. So let me explain real quick. The 90-10 models is actually for the Spanish program. That means you're going to start out 90 in kindergarten, 90% of the day would be in Spanish. And but half of the half of the student population have to be native Spanish speakers. Mm. And half of the program of the classroom has to be English speakers. The purpose for that is that they can uh, exchange their language within the classroom. So the English speakers do not know Spanish, so they have to speak English to the Spanish speakers. The Spanish speakers do not know English, therefore they have to speak Spanish to to the English speakers. So therefore, it's immersed. That's why it's called immersed. Mm. So all day long, the two languages are spoken. So. But when, when the Spanish is being taught, no English is allowed. And then when they get to first grade, it's 80% in Spanish. And in second grade, 70% in Spanish. And by the time they're fifth grade, that would be 50-50. Okay. And then they're 50-50. And so they will learn both all of the core content in both languages. So by the time they get to eighth grade, they will take a STEM test, which is a national test. And depending on the um, on the the success uh, of their proficiency test, they get high school credits. So for example, after eight year credits, they can get up to four year AP English and uh, Spanish classes. And then once you get to high school, they will get a bilateral seal in their transcript. So bilingual is in the transcript, meaning that they are officially bilingual in two languages, and they can get credits, AP uh, college credits. And some of the kids, when they go through this dual language program, they get one year under their belt of credit in colleges. It depends on the colleges that they go to. So that's what dual language program is about. But Vietnamese, pro Vietnamese students never had the opportunity to do that. So... But for Vietnamese program, we do 50-50 model. That means half a day in English, half a day in Vietnamese. Half of the um, population is Vietnamese uh, who do not speak English, comes from Vietnamese um, families. Half of the students are English-speaking students, mainstream students, white. Well, why would the white kids' parents want to sign them up with Vietnamese dual language immersion? So, good question, because uh, when we started the Vietnamese dual language program, it was not the English-speaking parents that we have challenged recruiting, but it was the Vietnamese parents that we have challenged recruiting. The English-speaking parents who wants their kids in dual language are very well versed, are very versed in dual language, in brain theories, in why do they need kids need to learn language. The parents in, were the parents were yeah, well the parents. The, wow. the English, yeah, the, 
You so know that that wasn't a challenge to get like white English speaking parents to sign up for their kids. No, we have waiting lists for Vietnamese dual language from the English white speaking parents to get into Vietnamese language. Fascinating. Yes, but here's the thing: how do we get the? That's how we get to start. Is a, a long story, but but on the Vietnamese parents, here are the challenge. Here were the challenges. <laughs> a lot of challenges. First of all, we believe that English is the language of this country. To be successful, you have to know language. So if you want to learn half of the day in Vietnamese, how are you going to be able to cut up, catch up in Vietnamese in English to be as equally, you know, fluent like like uh, we will learn English all day long. We believe that we can do language school on Saturday and Sunday as a site, Vietnamese, if we really, we really want to maintain the language and culture. So why would we want to do Vietnamese dual language? So, <laughs> so we have to do a lot of workshops explaining to our parents the brain research why uh, other dual language programs are so successful? What are the benefits of dual language program, like middle school, high school, you know, colleges? And then they, and now here's, here's the one that, that, that blows my mind and is still doing it. What language are you going to speak? What language are you going to teach? North Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, pre-75, post-75? And I'm like, it was like, it was two years with the Vietnamese dual language, uh, with the Vietnamese parents on, to, to convince them that their kids will benefit from this program. But how did you answer that question of North, South, pre, post? How did you answer these questions? <laughs> how did you figure that out? Well, I, of course, I... Um, didn't really give them an answer. I because I want to hear from them as well. So I I set up a Vietnamese community a committee. So I in that committee I involve the progressive Vietnamese Americans, the uh, parents who are still stuck in the trauma that they are in um and i you know and we i've heard your other discussion with aaron about this this is the, the same you know i think it's the same uh, challenge as we have um, across the country um and then i have educators and i have uh and we call it vietnamese advocacy committee so um we end up uh, hiring a very prominent um, Vietnamese teacher who was a, uh, what do we, he's a priest? Not a priest. No, he's not a priest. A uh, 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 pastor. Yeah, pastor. Um, who is also our teacher already, uh, licenses everything. And so, he was part of the committee, and so we was able to work on the curriculum with everybody, and then we start hiring teachers, and you know the teachers are all from United States, so they, it was okay with them. It was okay. So we kind of got a blessing from this committee to start, and that's how I answered the questions. So and in and then I also have I also had to go out to. Uh, churches, um, temples, Vietnamese communities, Oregon, very political, and invite them to be part of this committee. I did a lot of work with the Vietnamese community, more than the English-speaking yeah. family. I'm telling you, it's like all of the prep was in the Vietnamese community. And the other work is really the money, it's the district, money, Policies, curriculum, those are in my, in my like power, in my, you know, like, wheelhouse. 
my warehouse that I can do this part. I'm like, Oh my God. Brand new to oh you. Oh my God. <laughs> Is the program still going on? Yes. You should, that's why I'm like, you should come up. But yes, the program is still going on and it is, it's in its 10th year. We're going to have a 10th year celebration. And the first cohort was iffy. We have a smaller cohort um, because of the, you know, we were not able to convince a lot of parents and there was, and there was less Vietnamese, less uh, English speaking parents um, because we have to, what we call it, um, what's the word that we use here? Uh, commodify. I wrote, I had a book on it. So we, I wrote a chapter on how did I start with the Vietnamese dual language program and all these information is in there. But uh, what really commodifying, do you know the word commodi commodify? Uh, I knew, I do know the word. Okay. So in um, my, t the title of the, the chapter is Vietnamese Dual Language Immersion, Commodifying and Uncommodify Language and Culture. Yeah, so let's, how, let's define that word commodity. they can use Spanish, Japanese, Chinese, Mandarin, beneficial to their kids. They can use that anywhere in the world. They can have a job like this if they have, if they speak one of those languages. So how do we promote Vietnamese to be one of those language? Because what are the, what are these English speakers are going to do with the Vietnamese language? Yeah. Right? So that is the barrier for the board because for us to have the board approval and for us to to um, give us money and for us to give this to do this work, we need to get the Vietnamese parents to come to the board and talk to the parents. But how do we convince the board and all the staff to put them millions of dollars to to start a program? Right. First of all, equivalence. Second of all, is like I have to empower. Uh, the business community. You said, "Oh yes, we do need Vietnamese speakers." So I would, I went to Nike, Columbia Sportwear, and Intel, the companies that actually have a lot of manufacturers in Vietnam. Um, that's why I was wondering why did this happen in Portland and not in Orange County? Because I don't think that video or dual language immersion exists in Southern California, does it? I could be very there wrong. Three, there's three programs. So there's three programs around the country. No, the people in California because they started after us. We are the first of one of the two, the first that one, and then we uh, coach. We have a a, a, a collision of Vietnamese dual language program that has six districts in it right now, and I in Houston, uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, and we actually um, work with them and advise them and work with them on how to start that. And they also work with the parents group as well. Very cool to hear. So wait, so you started the first one in the country? No, the second one. Highland is the first one. There's Highland is the first one. It's in, uh, Seattle, um, in Washington, close to Seattle. But they started the program, but they started it, but they did not as much money or powerful as the Portland Public School because I'm the you know, one thing is that I'm the insider. I have the I have the knowledge. I'm a dual language researcher. And I hold one of the most powerful positions in PPS. So I was able to get a lot of peers. And so ours take off much faster and much stronger. So we probably one of the best program in, and, in the United States. And, and one thing I'm really curious about listening to all of this is the first cohorts, the first, second, third cohorts are probably what? Are they in high school now? They're, are they yes, they're ninth grade. They're ninth grade. Okay. And do you ever get to interview or do any research on where they've landed academically or test scores or how it's affected their overall um, standing in the world? Of course. Um, we keep track of their uh, test scores. We, um, you know, we support them. And um, eight, 
now the eight ninth graders and eighth graders they pass all the STEM tests, the language tests in both languages, and they met um, U.S. test scores as well, along with the Vietnamese proficiency test worldwide. I mean, this proficiency test is not something that Portland does. This proficiency test is the national foreign language test. That is just being across the world, not the, even just a country, it's across the world. So all of our kids. And the, and the challenge of Vietnamese, of dual language period is attrition. Right. We would lose them along the way. So we always like the end of the eighth grade, we always like um, the dual language always have like a research residency trip. Meaning that the kids get to go to their target language and do a proposal or research and then they can come back and present to the community. And because of COVID and because the program is new, mm -hmm. the first trip has been delayed and we were hoping to do it this year, but it hasn't been um, a go yet. So we hopefully we'll do it next year. So we're gonna do a, probably a, a really nice gala uh, for the 10th year. So I would love to invite you to come when we have that. Yeah, that would be great. Aaron is coming uh tomorrow i'm sorry tonight and i'll take her tomorrow to the vietnamese dual language school that's why i was hoping that you guys can come and go visit the vietnamese dual language school mm, so exciting to to hear about this work and you know what is the overall feelings of the parents the vietnamese parents that have gone and taken their kids through this journey <clears throat> so uh, Vietnamese parents are very excited um, that we have a Vietnamese dual language program. And just three days ago, um, a family with two kids who's a first grader and third grader called me last week and said, oh, we would like to be in the Vietnamese dual language program, but we don't live in Portland Public Schools, so can you get us in? And so we... You know, we help her fill out our district forms and why do this, why that, and took a test. And now we have two brand new Vietnamese students who just came from Vietnam to come in um, to start as first grade and third grader. And so this is the exciting part about it. You know, students who first now newly come to the United States also have a place to come in, uh, validate their language and learn English at the same time. That's the best way to learn English, to language immersion. Yes. So it, it, it's very different from an ESL model, I'm understanding, right? Oh, no. Yes, correct. And, and so do you advocate keeping around ESL models anymore? Or do you say we should just do immersion, dual language immersions everywhere we go? Um, I'm biased, first of all. I would say that dual language, I'm not biased. I, as a matter of fact, it's a true statement. Uh, dual language is the way to go for this country, for any country. Because if you think of other countries, right, we learn two languages when we were very young in Vietnam. It's, it's not, you know, like any country, Australia, Europe, any country. Europe, Europe right. Is, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, all the kids. Right. And so, it number one, it helps all students. Two is that not just academically, but culturally and emotionally. And peace, you know, how do we create peace is to understand each other. Cultural, if they're more open-minded to other when, cultural and language than when they're younger, their mind, their thinking, their, it change completely. So yes, if I have my way, you know, I could have, I would love to turn PPS into a dual but, but school, let me ask you, language school. Yeah, let me ask you about the budgets though. When you... It, when you introduce um, a dual a language immersion program into a school, doesn't that increase the budget by quite a bit because you have to like institute all of these sort of systems, this infrastructure into the classroom or set up uh, these programs that are non-existent and you have to create them into existence and that creates a lot of costs, no? Oh, yes, definitely at the beginning, right? Definitely at the beginning. Um, so, for example, the Vietnamese dual language program, uh, the planning for this, like I said, the Vietnamese uh, community 
community and you know there's no there's not a lot of money to pay for food and all of that no no big deal but you know when you start talking about um curriculum then it's you starting you're talking about a lot of money money or a start program like like Vietnamese language but not Spanish because all the curriculum material are now in five languages Russian Chinese Spanish um, they're all available in five languages except for Vietnamese so so for us we have to have um, a teacher in the committee working on a curriculum for kindergarten and then first grade we have to do it slowly <laughs> and yeah. then third grade so like we first we started kindergarten and first grade right that's what we start on and then when first grade and kindergarten started then we start working on second and third so so for now we have yeah. curriculum up to ninth grade right? <laughs> but we don't have it up to, to 12th grade yet because we know what the standards are because the standards are standards from oregon mm. so it's not like we create standards we follow standards so whatever the district curriculum is the challenge is translation and translation sometimes they not um, come across the same so we also have to buy supplement uh, supplemental um, material so and then here's the thing we do not have Vietnamese teachers available for this program oh wow so when I propose this program I also have to propose because I have to propose how do I create recruit teachers, teachers. recruit teachers and so when we propose this Vietnamese language program I have to learn I have to start from A to Z because I know what the board are going to ask I know what the requirement is going to be for this program I know what commitment is going to require of all of us including the parents when I start we start this program and I was <clears throat> lucky enough to stay with the uh, program for seven and eight years before I retired um, so it was at the a level where I'm now still continue working on it outside, um, outside and supporting the Vietnamese, um, uh, Hun and <clears throat> Ovika. Ovika has education in this. It's really about supporting to give another umbrella over this Vietnamese language program, because when I'm out there, I know that it's going to fizzle. So if there's an outside organization that still keep the pressure on the big picture that's how we're gonna that's how we're going to um, co um, continue and stay focused so so when I propose the teacher <clears throat> um I try to recruit teachers uh one or two teachers because oh let's go <clears throat> uh cost so it costs money to recruit teachers it also costs um curriculum translation the first year I went to Vietnam with a teacher to kind of look for material that supplement the core and trying to be very careful of not having like any politics <laughs> in this curriculum I have to go sit and flip every single page of the book yeah. like you know there's a lot of fairy tales there's a lot of stories but I just want to make sure there's nothing. So first couple, two, three years, we did that. So that was part of the cost as well, is really to travel to Vietnam and travel. We would travel to to um, Highland, and we traveled to some other bilingual programs. You know, bilingual programs are different than dual language, right? Yeah. Yeah, so there's some bilingual, but they're not truly like right. research-based dual language program. Um. And then we went to also observe the Hmong, uh, Minnesota. They have the Hmong dual language immersion that is excellent. That is really like a model to go after. So we, I went to see, I went to observe that with a teacher. So the cost of beginning of a program that Vietnamese dual language was a lot, but we also was able to write a grant from Oregon Department of Education to, 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 to cover this cost because Portland Public School alone will not be able to cover it and and it's inequity if I we put so much money in something and then I I I got in a lot of controversial conversation with my my peers because you studying a Vietnamese your language because we you Vietnamese and I say 
definitely. I start the Vietnamese dual language because I'm Vietnamese. There's a lot of Spanish speakers here who start the Spanish language programs and who do language programs because you're Spanish. So what's wrong with me being Vietnamese advocating for Vietnamese program? So I had to, that internal, there's a lot of internal battle that I also have to fight. Yeah. Um, so this, um, I, I wanted to ask you about going to Vietnam and, and doing research to bring back, but have you ever thought of bringing back what you know, your education um, in the, your understanding of the education system in the United States, bringing it back to Vietnam to, to work with the Vietnamese people? D is that something that you've ever thought about? Um, yes, that's what I'm doing. That's what Vika is for, uh, or uh, education. So since I retired, I have worked um, with Ho Phu Huân uh, to find a sister school in Vietnam. So we, uh, Ho Phu Huân, um, really... Uh, pay for the first trip, the first class about three years ago. I went to Vietnam with a teacher, with two teachers and a, a parent to actually uh, look at eight schools. And the, these eight schools were chosen by the ambassador of Vietnam from United States uh, you, um, and U.S. ambassador and then um, some connections. Because you cannot go in and visit oh. Vietnamese school without any um recommendation or any paperwork. You have to go top down. In Vietnam, it's always like top down. You know, like you, you, you don't do anything like you. You cannot go into walk into school and say, oh, let me observe a school. So we did that. And um, um, we have eight, eight schools to choose from. And so we did eight school. And so, of course, I did uh, the criteria first, uh, like for example, which school do we look into? Uh, and these are most of them are international schools. Um, there's one Vietnamese school. Uh, so we have criteria like uh, do they align with the standard in the United States? Do they talk about racial equity? Do they talk about uh, equity, gender equity? Do they teach about bullying? Do they teach any of the social skill set or do they just basically do academic, right? So we went through all of it and we chose one school in Hanoi uh, that's called Olympia. And then when we signed the MOU of understanding for the sister school, the U.S. embassy, ambassador from Vietnam, U.S., um, had his officer came and acknowledged the program and the connection that we are the first sisters K twelve sister school in the whole United States and Vietnam. Wow! So now we can do learning um, like classroom without border. We can do Zoom classes. We can do um, pen pal, and we can do activities uh, between the two schools. So, for example, if they're going to the, the, the new year coming up, then there'll be celebration that we so then we will do zoom we will videotape and they will do it together and then the kids um i um so last year uh i sent we have three four kids came as an exam as what you call them like um exchange students. Two of them are my, yeah like like um to see uh to go to school in hanoi for a week just we just drop them in the school let them study and then we just you know be outside and visiting, and then and then learn from them, and they make so much friends, and and they make so many friends. It's a semi memory, and so now I would like to do that um, for anybody who wants to do that. Uh, but the sister, and then the sister school is that when they're going to do the research residency for a week as well. So, and then I would come, I come back, and I do a lot. I do a couple of trainings already to teachers. There's so much more to the education system, both here in the United States and in Vietnam, and the changes that are happening, the changes that are happening, the evolution of academic freedom in Vietnam and what it's doing to the politics, the history, the sociology, the fabric of society in Vietnam is so, um, it's so interesting and it's ever changing. And 
I'd like to probably get another um, podcast episode with you in a few more weeks or months to actually talk about the development there, because I think today we talked about the Vietnamese dual language immersion programs here in the United States and, and the development of it. But I think um, we will save uh, the next episode and talk about the next chapter of It Sounds Your Life uh, and your development, the roles that you've now uh, and, and embarking on um, for the development of education in Vietnam. Um, so I want to thank you, first off, for coming on today. And uh, it was relatively painless, I hope, for you. Um, <laughs> I understand it was your first podcast, but you did very, very well. And I enjoyed it thoroughly and learned a lot. Well, thank you, Kenneth, for um, um, giving me the opportunity to do this. I hope I just didn't babble. Uh, but it's, education is one of my passion, actually one of my number one passion, because I think it's, like I said, it's the civil rights of all of us. Um, and that's how we equalize. Um, we hope to equalize the inequity of the world. Well, thank you so much, Jivan. I will see you this weekend up at the uh, Oregon, up in Eugene uh, for the conference. And thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. Special thanks to Brittany Tran, to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Crystal Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast.